And, um, but what we thought we'd do for this part of the demonstration is just make the two main dishes. We're making my bee pot pie tonight. Uh, you can do bee pot pie in a great big, you know, 13 by nine, but I like doing it in individual ramekins. I think it makes it more kid friendly. I think it makes it more fun to serve at a dinner party. It's easier to work with when you've got individual portions. Chef and her team have done a beautiful job. Are we starting with pot pie tonight, Chef? We can definitely start with the pot pie. We're okay, ready, let's do ready, that. We're ready to go. So uh, there's, there's two ways that he has in his book that show to do the pot pie. You can do it with a leftover steak, or you can do it with leftover uh, pot roast, or leftover brisket, or something along that line, where the meat is already tender and cooked. But if you're starting with uh, a beef that is, that is raw, yeah, it's, 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 also, it's also very simple to do. It's a, a traditional stew, stew. So you have nice little beef cubes that you can get from your butcher. It is traditional beef stew. You can just ask your butcher for that. Beef stew meat. And the, the key, the main thing that you need to do with all of your meats is the seasoning of it. So it's got to be a generous amount of salt, generous amount of pepper, and you have a nice hot pan. These things don't ever get them at home. <laughs> well, and one thing, that, one thing that I'm sure Chef would agree with also, it's very important when you're browning any kind of meat, whether it's beef, chicken, pork, don't overcrowd the pan. Exactly. While it may all get cooked thoroughly, you're not going to get a nice sear on the outside of the pan. And remember, when we sear meat, what are we getting? We're getting an extra layer of flavor. Yes. You know, I always tell my foodies, grill marks are not just for show. Grill marks are flavor. So you want to make sure that you get a nice sear and start with a screaming hot pan so that you get a really nice sear, but then back that heat off. You don't want to cook the meat too high because if you do that, it yeah, begins to seize up. Yeah, it's going to burn and seize and it's going to tighten up. When you when you crowd the pan, what happens is that it just steams. You don't have that, you don't have the ability to get the capitalization on it. So it'll just steam and the water will come out into it. Instead of going back in, it just stays out of it. And the other thing is everybody wants to play with meat. Don't play with it. Leave it. When that meat is ready to be turned, it will release itself from the pan. Don't sit there and try to like move it when it's not ready. When the pan's less hot, you see, that the other like, fuel starts to brown nicely. You start to move it too fast and it's stuck. If it's stuck, don't move it. Leave it. It's sending you a message. It's telling you I'm, I'm just fine, thanks. I'm not ready. Yeah, don't turn me over. Yeah, I'm good. Hey, back off. I'm done. I'll let you know what I'm doing. Exactly. So you get your meat, you get your meat nice and brown. Here. We're doing like the magic of TV and the magic of demo here tonight. I know a little bit about that. <laughs> Beautiful brown caramelization. Does everybody see that? It can be a little bit darker, but it will be great. We got nice color on it, and again, season well. You need to season your meat, salt and pepper, before you even start it. And just, by the, as the recipe goes, boom, we're going to take this off. We're going to get the excess fat out of that pan. And then what we're going to do next is that we're going to have the, the onions. We're going to add the onions into there. Now my recipe for this calls for red onion, which as you know is a little sweeter. You can do any onion that you like. I, when I'm cooking um, really straight savory and I need an onion, I'll many times use the yellow or a Spanish onion. I think they're a little more uh, aromatic and a little more flavorful, but any onion will work with this. Yes, it's nice. And anything you saute in butter is perfect. It's absolutely delicious. Okay, just what, saying. What I like to do too is if you start your onions first before you put your garlic in, the garlic will burn quicker. You want to get these nice and caramelized and sweated nice. Then they take a little bit longer time. If you put your garlic in, it's going to cook really quick. And actually, when garlic burns, if it burns, it'll get bitter. And you don't want to have that bitterness in your stew. So you do that nice. Get that going. Then you add your garlic into there. Well. Let's talk fresh versus pre-minced and pre-chopped garlic you buy in the grocery store. Yep. Yeah, don't do it. Yeah. Um, you know what? I know it takes a little longer to chop your own vegetables, but boy, I'll tell you what. When you buy garlic already minced in a jar, you know, what you, you know what you're really sacrificing? The flavor. You're giving a lot of it away because they have filled it with preservatives. Did you ever see the expiration date on garlic and those squeeze tubes? If it's good for two years, Not don't good. buy it. <laughs> There's something in there you don't need to be eating. Yeah. Yeah, and there's beautiful flavor in garlic. The, the, the fresh garlic, the, the smaller you make it, the more intense the flavor. If you don't like a lot of garlic flavor, then just take the whole clove, smash it, and then put it in there. 
to like the more subtle garlic flavor. The smaller it is, the more intense the flavor is actually going to be. Alright, so with this, now we have the butter in there with the garlic and the onions. And the way that the stew actually gets its thickness from is from a root. And that's flour and butter. So you add the butter, into the, the flour into the butter afterwards. But you have to remember that you have to put the rawness off of the flour. So get it in there with the butter. Give it Chef, a few do you minutes. Like to, do you like to wait until it turns kind of a, uh, a brownish color? It depends. Actually, it depends. It depends on the more nutty. The browner it gets, the more nuttiness of, of the taste that you're going to get into your dish. People like it, people don't like it. The darker it is, the more nuttier it is. But you have to be very careful and watch it. Because if you don't continue to move it around and you're not paying attention to washing the heat, if that burns, again, you're going to get more bitterness into it. So you just want it to add like a nice thickness into it. So then you have your Worcestershire sauce. Which is here with I the had devil of a oh, 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 boy. Worcestershire, 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 Worcestershire. And then you have your stock. Nice little beef stock. There are beautiful beef stock ones. If you not, it takes a long time to make a beef stock. You can buy canned beef stock, box beef stock. There are some really good quality ones out there. But then there are also natural bases that are wonderful and delicious, like a Beaumont or a, a, a what's it called? Better than bouillon. I use better than bouillon. Better than bouillon. Can I also say about that? They have a full uh, salt version and a low sodium version. Many yes. times I find with those bases and with prepared stocks, they can be very salty. So you want to yep. be uh, cautious if you're concerned about salt content. Salt content. You can always do um, a reduced sodium, which is good. But better than bouillon is a favorite brand. Great. So now you have this going, then you're going to add your beef back into that. Now, if, if, it's, if it's not already made beef, this you're going to let cook. You're going to cover it and you're going to let it cook down. We have fresh parsley that you're going to add into this. These are your herbs. It's beautiful. And then everybody goes, oh, I need to have fresh thyme. All I need to have is dry thyme. Dry herbs are so beautiful when you when you come to to a, to a, a braise or a stew or something that's going to cook for a long time. You have such beautiful smells. Smell on this thyme. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't so break down. It's so beautiful. So I recommend the dry herbs on that level. When you're gonna do, when you're gonna do a braise or a stew or something along that nature, it's beautiful. Okay. Can you see it's already starting to thicken up? See how it's nice. Yeah. See how nice and thick that is. Then you would cover it, and the David's recipe. Me, the David's recipe. He pre pre boils the potatoes. That is a good. It's a good method. Because then they don't break down, they're cooked, and you know when to put them back in. If you put them in, if you put them in too early, what happens is that they break down. They don't, they don't hold their integrity. If you just boil, you cut them and then boil them, and you hold them off to the side, and then put them into the later part of the, of the last part of when the stew is cooking, then you still maintain the integrity of the potatoes, and you have that. Otherwise, then they just become mush. And they actually do add as a thickening, thickening agent to the stew into itself. So let's pretend that this is cooked for a long time. <laughs> and that meat is broken down and nice and soft. We add our potatoes. Now, and one thing I would also suggest, pardon me, Chef. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you'll want to dice these small. These are about, what, about a half an inch? Yeah, about half Yeah, you want to, and depending on the size ramekin you're using, you'll want to go a half inch or maybe just a little smaller, depending on, on what size. Um, now, the ramekins we're serving tonight, we wanted to do more of a tasting plate for you. Now, if I were at home, I'd have a portion of this big because I'm not going to eat it. But I will tell you, um, I would make uh, try to make all of your slices, whenever you're dicing something for ingredients for any kind of soup or stew, make sure they're uniform, uniform in size because they'll cook more even. Okay. And the other thing, too, is like at the end, you're going to add in just a little bit of cream because that's just going to give it nice, thick, and richness. But also, again, be careful with that. You want to add it at the end. You don't want to add it if it's too early because the cream can break down and, and separate the fats and stuff like that. So, there are beautiful frozen vegetables too. If you want to use fresh, do it. You Knock do yourself it. out. Do, do whatever it is that you'd like to do. But you just get nice frozen vegetables. Use that, put those in. And then what you do, and this reduces down a little bit, that's fine, right with that. And we talked about this too, I think. There's frozen puff pastries. Pepper Sharp, these brand, but there's there's a hundred 
on the ones that are beautiful to use. Don't try to make don't try to make yourself as a nightmare. Take your chest up to do it. They want to buy it. So you have this beautiful cut it out to the size of of your ramekin. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking. I feel like I'm talking over something. And um, what you do is this: you cut it out, you egg wash it. And this egg wash is just it's egg and egg. A little water. Egg and a little water. We're going to just keep it on this little piece of parchment unto itself. If you want it to puff really high, don't do anything to it. Leave it like that. If you want it to like just kind of not puff as high, you take a little fork and you dock it. And that's just going to let the, the steam escape. And it'll rise, but it's not going to rise really high. And then we also find that because it just needs some seasoning, you put a little Maldon salt. Maldon salt here, I'm gonna pass it around too. It's a textured salt. You can taste it. We're gonna put that in the oven. And don't, don't skip the salt step because I think that really gives the it puff gives pastry a little, extra, a little extra bite. I think the mistake a lot of home cooks make is they do this beautiful puff pastry, but then it's very bland and yes. it doesn't have a lot of flavor. And you're digging through it to find the flavor. Right. Trust me, you're gonna have some flavor in this in this pot pie tonight because <laughs> I've already tasted it and it's mm, really good. Um, right. So then, yes. Yeah. So then, now you take your stew, you put it into your little ramekin. This is not an oven-proof bowl, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So you just pile it all nicely in there. And you can, if it's in a ramekin and you want to do this for a, di uh, for a dinner party or something, and you want to make it advance, you can set these up. And then you can put foil over them, put them on a tray, and then just put them in the oven, keep them nice and warm. These will be made in advance as well. This is what they look like. And then, boom. You got a beautiful. This is a classic mm. Southern comfort food dish that I grew up on. And what's nice about this? It's a classic this, everything. I think it is. I don't think I think beef pot pie is not really indigenous to the South. But it's one of those things where everyone relates to it. All the ingredients inside are understandable. This is the kind of food that everybody relates to. The ingredients are easy to find in your supermarket. And then you look just a little gourmet by putting that puff pastry on top. Nobody but, needs to know that you took some shortcuts. But it also makes it easier. Yeah. It's so much easier. And it takes the stress out of your cooking. One thing 